Good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? We've had a, uh, we've been ballerina out, I'm afraid. There was, uh, we were supposed to have uh, a lot more people coming. I'm sure they'll be on their way once they battle their way through 10,000 screaming little girls. That's like uh, the old days when Johnny Connolly was playing. That's what it used to be like. Um, welcome here this morning. We're going to talk about uh, professionalism in sport and uh, whether or not um, sports people are worse behaved now than they were 30 or 40 years ago or whether or not the fact that they've got so much money means they're worse behaved. Just to introduce our panel, on the end there's Mary Collier. Anyone that listens to 4BC would know Mary. She's uh, now the breakfast announcer. She's had a very varied career. She was the first woman in Australia to uh, be um, chairman of a race club and uh, that was an exciting experience for her with the good old boys. Uh, <laughs> she's also a former president of the Jockeys Association. She's well known around the races and sporting circles in Brisbane. Dennis Cottrell, of course, famous Australian swimming coach. And uh, looking at his nose, he had a few games of football on his time as well. He, uh, still, he's come all the way from the Gold Coast. Uh, Dennis was just telling me they had their uh, annual conference down there and he's behaved himself. So he's, uh, he's well, you're looking well, mate. That's the main thing. Debbie Spillane, of course, Australia's most, one of Australia's most famous uh, sports reporters, has been for a long, long time. Do you want to tell us how long, Deb? You don't have to, but uh, Debbie's been around for a long time, of course, with the ABC, and she's highly respected across a broad spectrum of sports. Lindsay Morgan, of course, is the uh, Wallaroos prop. Lindsay, uh, now living in Canberra, came brought the rain with it when she came back up here, but uh, generally regarded as probably Australia's best woman rugby union player. Um, she can't play sevens yet and go to the Olympics, but she's working on that. <laughs> Michael Blucher, former uh, journalist. He was uh, the very first PR man at the QRU, introduced some famous things, such as turning the sprinklers on in the grand final one year. And of course, the uh, was it coup de grace, mate, when we got the uh, people that were supposed to parachute in at 20 to 3, landed at 10 past 3, halfway through the grand final, right in the middle of the oval. So <laughs> he's had some outstanding promotions over the years. He's now Brisbane's... Uh, Sports guru, he, uh, but he also runs a company which, in effect, uh, helps train young athletes and uh, how to behave themselves when they go out in public. He's been tremendously successful. John Connolly, of course, well known to everyone, well known rugby union player here before taking up coaching. He's Queensland's most successful rugby union coach. He uh, then, of course, coached the Wallabies at the last World Cup. And he's now running for Parliament. Uh, things are going pretty well. Once he realises you're supposed to kiss the babies and shake hands with the mothers, not the other way around, John. But he's, uh, he's standing for the seat of Nicklin. So we'll get down to it. And what I thought I'd do is just set the scene first of all, because there's such a broad spectrum of people, just to give you an idea of um, what sort of money people can earn now and what they probably earned 20 or 30 years ago in the various sports. So we'll start with Mary and jockeys, who, of course... Uh, We've just recently had the tragic death of Staffy Katsidis, who was our top jockey here in Queensland. He uh, died from a drug overdose, so uh, he's probably a perfect example. But Mary, 20 years ago, what did they earn and what can they earn now? Yeah, look, now the riding fee in Queensland sits at about $150 per ride. So that's every time a jockey is engaged to ride a mount, regardless of where they're riding, if it's um, up at Kilcoy or if it's, you know, a Doombin 10,000 meeting next week. Plus, they get 10% of any prize money they earned. Um, obviously, this has grown just an incredible amount from 20 or 30 years ago, but I don't think it's the amount of money they actually earn that is the issue, say, in racing, and for jockeys in particular. I think it is how it's distributed to the young kids these days. If you look at the changes from 30 or 40 or 50 years ago, when kids started out as apprentice jockeys, they weren't entitled to or allowed basically access to any of their wages. They had that master-apprentice relationship, their money was held in a trust fund until they completed their apprenticeship or they reached 21 years of age. So they didn't sort of have uh, access to the ready cash at sort of 17 or 20 that the apprentice jockeys and young riders of today do. And I think that's what's made a tremendous difference in, in the sport of racing in particular. These days, a, a young, you know, able apprentice, you know, could easily earn $150,000, $200,000 a year um, you know, with only sort of two years in the sport. Now, if you, if you think of how you were at, you know, 19 or 20 or 18 years of age, what are you going to do with that amount of money? So, you know, what, whilst I don't begrudge at all the amount of money they earn, and particularly in a sport like racing where your sacrifices are huge, 
I certainly think that there's an obligation on administrators to make sure that they, in this modern day and age, can actually manage that money a little bit better. I don't want to see them denied access to all their funds like they were in the past, but I think we need to, to look at ways to, to ensure that they don't just blow every single cent they earn. Thanks, Mary. Dennis, uh, you've been around for a long, long time as a swimming coach. You've seen some of the greats. What sort of money could a great uh, earn now compared with, say, someone like Dawn Fraser back in the 60s, mate? Um, well, apart from about uh, three, four, five people, there's been... No one's had any real earn in, in swimming in the history of the sport, actually. At the moment, uh, Dan Kowalski's in charge of the athletes commission and he said he seems to run into opposition every time he runs into a Swimming Australia board member. He's currently trying, well from, the, from what you say in the past, there was absolutely nothing. Uh, Tracy Wickham, 10 years on or so, 20 years on from Dawn Fraser will attest to that despite her achievements. Um, at the moment, the most anyone can earn in swimming is probably I think the cap is around 30, 35,000. You get a, a, an allowance, uh, direct athlete support, uh, it's capped at 15,000. Well, currently, I think they're trying now to extend it to 30,000. You then also get bonuses for your world ranking. So as it comes out at the moment, if you're ranked number one in the world and you're on the, a current Australian team member, you can be looking at 30 to 35,000 tops. So that's basically it in swimming. The best an, an a swimmer can achieve is, I think it's uh, Christmas if they can afford a car. Oh, that's interesting. I uh, would have thought it was a lot more than that. We'll get back to that in a moment, actually, Dennis, because I want to ask you about a couple of incidents recently uh, in the swimming. But Debbie, yeah, as I said, you've covered a wide spectrum of sports. Um, have you noticed that uh, there's much more spending money now for, for sports people you deal with, or uh, have they always been big free spenders? Uh, Mark, all, all I can say is if money was my strong point and thinking about what other people earned was something I did a lot, I wouldn't work for the ABC. <laughs> and I'd like to just point out, by the way, that I'm with ABC News Radio. Uh, it's a very specific part of the ABC that's involved in particular with this... Uh, with this Ideas Festival, so I, just, I don't actually work for ABC Sport, I work for ABC News Radio as, the, as their sports presenter, so I just wanted to make that clear. Look, I, you know, I can remember the days when, when footballers, for instance, were part-time, in, in the sense that they, they would train a few, few nights a week. You know, when I was a kid, it was probably before I, I got into sports reporting, uh, and, and then I was involved a little bit with the NBL, where, where the players weren't you know, w weren't earning a lot of money. I'd, I've never known exactly what people are earning. Even when I, wo I worked for the Bulldogs in the mid-90s, and uh, I mean, it's none of my business what people are earning, but I think it's obvious that there are more opportunities for people to be full-time sportsmen in some sports than, th than there were 20 or 30 years ago, but exactly what dollar figures they are, I have no idea. We'll get back to that in a little while as well. Uh, so much spare time and free time, and you would have seen that at the Bulldogs. I had plenty of spare time, as we are well aware. Um, Lindsay. That was before. That was, that was. sorry, I was their media manager before all of that. I had the good sense to get out. Oh, no. Well, Australia's most famous rugby league team. Uh, the, uh, Lindsay, you play a sport which is still virtually amateur. Um, you might tell us about uh, your week, because you work in Canberra now, and... Uh, then you've got to make time for, for your sport, which is obviously as time-consuming as any professional sport. No, I, um, I found, especially uh, playing for Australia last year, it was pretty much six days a week and you had to fill in, fill, oh, do 40 hours of work a week and then try to do training above that. So it was a balancing act and I'm very grateful for my employer to be flexible in that. But it was trying to fit in that time. Um, it was really challenging. But then the goal and the... Um, the reward was so worth all that effort that made for Thanks, Lindsay. Now, Michael, you're often called in like a doctor to, uh, to help solve problem uh, children, as some of the players are, including... Yeah, I've uh, seen him uh, operate late at night. <laughs> but uh, you, you are actually called in. You might just explain why you are probably are so much in demand these days from various sports. I won't mention some of the people that you've uh, had to uh, counsel, but... Uh, are you finding that your um, 
role is becoming more and more important in, in a wider cross-section of sports. Well, Abby, I think it is a lot more important simply because the scrutiny, the level of scrutiny and the pressure that these kids are under now are just is, well, it's ridiculous to, to put a, a, a fine point on it. Um, and I'm sure we're going to get onto that uh, as we go through this morning. But specifically in relation to wages, um, in any sort of emotional debate about how much athletes earn, we go straight to the Gary Ablets, we go straight to the Darren Lockyer's, Jonathan Thurston's or Michael Clark's. What we don't focus is on the averages. And I can tell you that, I know John will cover off on rugby union, but um, NRL, the average player will play 55 games in his career and he will earn $233,000 a season. AFL, $241,000 a season and he'll play 44 games. So these are kids that are actually statistically going to finish up playing uh, two seasons and they're going to earn around that half a million dollar mark. If you look at cricket, to think Alan Border signed his last contract was $90,000. And that's what a, an average Sheffield Shield player playing in front of eight, nine, ten people on a weekly basis earns this now. So there's been significant advance, and, I, and I'm, I don't begrudge it, but I think we've got to get away from the emotion. The emotion is Gary Ablett, $1 million, they all earn a $1 million, they don't. Uh, and I've got to say, they work really, really hard, and they're on duty 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Thanks, Mike. Now, John, you played back when uh, it was a purely amateur game, except if you were Paul McLean, of course, uh, back in the 70s rugby union. And then, of course, you made the big step into coaching. And uh, you were the uh, first Queensland coach when the game went professional. Did you notice any difference uh, when the players all had jobs to when they were suddenly earning 200 grand a year? Yeah, I think I did. I mean, it's not the players' fault they're getting paid the money. You have a number of different tiers in terms of wages, and they're all tied to the television arrangements. Um, you've seen soccer in England, which is just massive. But rugby is geared to the t what television deal they do, as is the AFL. And in, in rugby, you've got a couple of different markets. You've got a European market and an Australian market. The Australian players, if you're a good Super 14 player that plays all the games, you, you'll probably get a couple of hundred grand a year, as Michael said. If you then go on and the top 30 get top-ups for the Australian Rugby Union, and those top-ups can be anywhere between 150 and four or $500,000 dependent on the player, if you're a superstar, and you'll get $10,000 a match. So in my time with the Wallabies, the top paid Australian player got 875000 for the year. And that was in 2007, 2006, I think. And he would have had third party deals on top of that. So he may work 1.2. But that's the, the very top, the top tier. Um, the problem is that, you know, we're talking about the top three or four, and it doesn't always filter down to the the guy that plays for six or seven seasons is a good player, earns a couple of hundred grand a year, finishes his, pays half that in tax, so it's, um, he can be left with nothing. So they definitely have to make hay while the sun shines. In rugby very much, you've also got an international market, one in France and England, although the euro and the pound does not do them any favours. When I coached in England, it was three to one, now it's about one and a half to one, I think. So the exchange rate's not helping them. But will you, you will get the the owner like Bougelier in Toulon or Max Guzzini in Paris with Rugby Union or Nigel Rad Saracens in Rugby that will out of their own pocket top up the superstar. So that's virtually the, the, the frame, the time frame. All right, well, we've sort of said you've got a fair idea, so you uh, want your son to be a jockey or a Rugby Union player, not a swimmer, obviously. <laughs> with the, uh, <laughs> But I just thought I'd get the panel to give their ideas on whether or not there really is a major problem with uh, sports people... Uh, having so much money and uh, not living up to their responsibilities. In other words, it's the debate whether or not sports people, and I mean basically young sports people, should be role models. And it really is a major problem in racing, I think, Mary. Don't you agree that uh, these kids go from uh, virtually getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning and literally cleaning out the manure in the stables to suddenly being driving around in Ferraris? Uh, but do you think the majority, majority of them are troublemakers or is it just one or two? No, I, I think um, <clears throat> what we're seeing in society at the moment is a consequence of the way, <clears throat> excuse me, the media's changed and the way that the reporting of incidents has changed, the way we communicate. We all have mobile phones with cameras um, on them. We have recording devices with us 24-7. The scrutiny, as some of the other speakers have said, is so high. I think it's, I, I mean, let's face the facts. It, any group, if you chose any group of young sports, uh, young Australian, uh, whether be they, you know, males or females, 
and you had 10,000 of them, you're going to find a, tr a few troublemakers amongst that group of people. And I think it doesn't matter whether you're earning as your first job out of uni or school, if you're earning $40,000 or if you're earning $200,000, there's going to be some wastage. You're 18, you're full of hormones and testosterone, the world's your oyster, you're out there having fun. It's just the difference with sports people is they are under intense media scrutiny. And when they make mistakes, their mistakes are sort of exemplified and perpetuated by the media. I think most of our sports people, 95% of our sports people, are just normal human beings going about their job in a responsible way and have respect for their salary levels and apply their salary carefully and responsibly. There's always going to be people on the, the extreme edges. You are always going to have your, your jockeys who are going to spend every cent they get. And whether that be on alcohol, wine, women or song, it doesn't matter. They will do that regardless. But I think they would do that whether they're a sports person or whether they're out laying concrete on the roads. Um, you're, a, you're a certain type of personality. But that doesn't mean as sort of sports administrators that there isn't a responsibility and you know obviously Michael's made a great business out of it to guide those people who need assistance. Young people will have parents, they'll have employers to guide them. Sports administrators need to start to guide those people who've gone off the rails as well. But at the end of the day I don't think it's the money they earn that necessarily relates to why a certain percentage are behaving badly. Dennis, um, swimming really has been one of the clean skin sports. Um, we ha did have, like, two years ago, a violent incident in a bar, and I think that would be probably the worst publicity the sport's ever had. Is there a conscious uh, effort in swimming to make certain that people stay level-headed, or is it just that it's a, it attracts a certain sort of personality to be a champion swimmer or a top swimmer? I think, I think most sports, uh, it's governed by the culture of the sport itself. Um, just say, in swimming, there's not enough time. With the commitment the kids have, there's really not enough time uh, to get in trouble. They're usually younger. Um, they, they grow up in a bit of a bubble, like a, a lot of other sports, but they've got usually uh, family orientation. They remain usually close to home. So unlike, say, football or, or a lot of other professional sports, now where they're getting them younger, they're, they're out of their home environment, uh, they actually have to be more formally trained. I think ours get uh, a more standard upbringing and I think that, that makes it easier uh, to expect a sense of normality. And as I said, the, the, the sport demands so much. They're putting in at least 35 hours a week in training. And if you equate that, and most of them go to school or university, there's not a lot of time for, for any uh, muck-ups there. So it, we've got a good culture in the sport, and it did hurt us with that, that incident. Um, but as everyone will know, we're, you know, it's going to be in e every phase of society, and no one, I don't think any sport's immune. So, you know, it would be foolish or reckless to think that, you know, we're above all that. You know, I, I think what, what you've just said, Mary, about the extra scrutiny, uh, that, and, and modern social um, networking and all the various forms of exposure that uh, willingly or otherwise, you know, is going to be put on you and, and picked up by the public. Um, you know, very little goes on that isn't seen and debated or somebody have an opinion on. So um, I just think we're lucky that, that in our sport that uh, they're so young and I think that they get to have a, a more normal upbringing. Thanks, Dennis. Debbie, um, as Dennis had just pointed out, the culture of the sport is very important. And um, while well, I did have a go to about uh, the ball there, the bogs, um, as a media officer, how important is it to have a, um, well, basically as clean an image as possible for uh, your club or for uh, individuals within that club? Well, it's important because a lot of sponsors obviously don't want bad publicity um, so fr from that point of view it's it's obviously important and, and, and I'm just I'm looking at, at the question here and it's interesting I've, I've got sort of uh, mixed feelings on it you know is it money for nothing and your chicks for free well you know that's a, a dire straight song 
And it's funny how nobody expects rock stars to be role models for their kids. No one says, hey, you know, have a look at, um, you know, Mick Jagger. That's how, that's how I want you to grow up, son, you know, or, um, or points to Deborah Harry or something and says, that's, uh, that's how I want my girl to grow up. So I'm not quite sure why there's this feeling that sports stars need to be role models. However, the, the one thing I do understand is what, you know, what Mary said about there's intense media scrutiny, and that's true, and it might seem unfair, but they've also got to remember, sports stars, that most of their income is derived from the media. So, you know, if you look at any of the major football codes, I mean, the reason, for instance, that Lindsay's sport isn't, which, that she isn't making a lot of money, is that her sport isn't televised. So, she's not getting, te you know, she's not her club's not getting a spillover of TV rights fees. There's not at her her sponsors aren't getting TV advertising, which is the big attraction. So I I can remember sort of thinking when the when the players I was at the Bulldogs when Super League was on, and when the players were bitching about the media, it's like, well, hang on, you have to step back here. And the reason you're all making hundreds of thousand dollars more than you were before Super League is because the media have kicked in this money, and there's a battle between two media empires for the rights to this game, and that's where the money has come from. So I understand that it doesn't seem fair that they're getting extra media scrutiny and people will follow, say, a footballer around and, and want to report on their misdemeanours, say, more than, than a rock star because people expect rock stars to, to behave like you know, money for nothing and the chicks for free. But you can't, at the same time, put your hand out and take the money that the media are giving you and then be annoyed that the media are going to in, be interested. I mean, I remember hearing Sonny Bill Williams, this was, you know, after I left the, the Bulldogs, I think there was some big story about him, um, you know, urinating up against a wall at, you know, 2.30 in the morning at Sutherland or whatever, and, and people said, oh, yeah, but 21-year-old boys do that, you know, guys do that all the time. <laughs> well, yes, but he's a 21-year-old boy who's sold his image. And if you want to sell your image and be on the bottle of Gatorade or whatever it is, I think managers need to take a little bit of responsibility here as well because they're keen to sell their their product. So, so you know, I'm just using Sonny Bill as an example here. I'm not picking on him. I'm just using him as an example. You are recognisable because your manager has convinced you that, you know, this will be great for you. You'll get, I don't know, 500 grand or whatever it is to be the, the face of Gatorade. Well, then you can't go pissing up against a wall on a Saturday night. You are not one or the other. You're not a normal 21-year-old boy. You're a 21-year-old boy who has sold your face so everyone will recognise you if that's what you choose to do on a Saturday night. So, you know, it's not money for nothing, the chicks for free. The money comes from the media and your exposure and your image. And so if you want to piss that up against a wall, that's going to come back to bite you. It was like Shane Warne taking... Um, money to be, uh, you know, an anti-smoking campaigner and then complaining because somebody followed him outside a restaurant and, and took a photo of him smoking cigarettes. Don't sell your image. If you don't want people to, to uh, know what you're doing and take an interest in what you're doing, then uh, don't sell yourself as, as, a, as a front person. Thanks, Steph. We'll get back to that in a moment, actually, because I wanted to ask you another very tricky question. But, Lindsay, I mean, uh, when you go out, you're very visible with red hair and... Uh, striking looking, do you actually um, do you actually set yourself when you go out to stay out of trouble um, because you're so visible? Is it, is that, I don't know if that's the right way to put the question, but basically, no. yeah. No, it's quite funny. Um, last year we had media training because, of course, with um, social networks, especially Facebook, we're all connected with our friends and family, and that's how we communicated how things were going with our um, training and our games. And, of course, they're... Rugby's got a big culture of going out, enjoying, especially celebrating after really successful wins. So then it was a very, you had to be careful and feel re you was responsible not for you, just yourself, but your other team members to act in a responsible way. Because even, I think it's amateur level and professional level, you sort of, there is, like you say, a media aspect that you want to you know, impress of what you're doing and not, it's just about the result, it's about the sport not what actually you're doing in your personal life. Thanks, Lindsay. Now, Michael will probably talk for 40 minutes on this subject because <laughs> he gives whole lectures, day-long lectures. But really, do you think that uh, sportsmen now are worse behaved than they were 20 years ago? <laughs> no, I don't, Obi. And I, I think it's really... 
I accept fully what Debbie's saying, selling of image and so forth, but I think at the end of the day it comes down to our expectations. And our expectations, by and large, are being driven by the media. And they're the ones driving the whole role model agenda because guess what? If the players aren't role models, then they haven't got anything right about it. Put your hand up here if you really care whether Willie Mason wheezes against a wall at 2.30 in the morning in Sydney. You, okay, one, one or two, fair enough. Three, please, no more, please, no more. <laughs> the, the other, but the other aspect is that a, lo a lot of these kids, um, well, some of them, some of the rugby league kids, for instance, have grown up in a caravan park with a stepfather holding a gun against his head. You put a jersey with a logo on them, and all of a sudden they're role models. So the, the expectations are, are really out of kilter with what these kids are capable. And I know we go through all these education processes. There's program after program and program, but largely we're selling saucepans to kids that don't have a kitchen, aren't hungry, don't want to learn how to cook. And if they do get hungry, they'll get their manager to sort it out and <coughs> whip up a meal for them. I will get back to you on the subject of man uh, managers as well. But John, you know, as an international coach in a very high profile sport, how important is it for you to keep a clamp on your players? Do you actually take an active role or do you leave that to the manager? No, you take an active role. I think long-term coaches are ones that have been very involved in the players' lives. So you have responsibility. I mean, I've bought houses for players. You go to their weddings, you go to the baptisms, you go to the whole lot. So you're very involved with their life. It always amuses me a little bit in terms of when people talk about role models. I, I, you know, you can't expect a guy to go out. You want, we want him to beat up on, his, on the other guy for two hours every week and beat the crap out of him. Then we say, we want you to be a role model. But what they have got is a responsibility to the game that gives them the lifestyle that they've got. You know, Debbie and everyone else have spoken about it, and that's what you talk to the players about. So as a coach, you're really a guiding light in some ways. I mean, you think of some great coaches over the years. I remember George Best once saying that um, I've spent 90% of my money on women, booze and gambling, and I wasted the other 10%. So um, you, you're trying to turn that round <laughs> completely and let them to waste the 10% and save the 90%. So it's, um, but as a coach, you're really a guide in life because Sonny Bill's a good example. He's a guy that has earned massive money since he was 17. He's never had a pile of bills on the fridge that he couldn't pay that most of us have and, and been through that. So, and they don't understand. And we can ask them to get another job. We can ask them. But the reality is the coaches that are coaching them want them out there nine to five every day, training, going to the gym. They have got free time. So as a coach, you're a mentor to them, trying to point them in the right direction. But they, in the amateur days, I remember being at home one night and I got the phone call at 2 o'clock in the morning. Matt, Matt Ryan, Mark Overhart and a couple of guys were on the dance floor at City Rowers. So, and the bouncers couldn't get them off the dance floor. So I put the tracksuit on, gone to town, told them to get off the dance floor and go home. So if that happened today, it would be a huge media issue. When I was with the Wallabies, we got a photo from the Herald. They were going to run it on the Thursday that Ben Robinson was seen out drinking three days before a test. And he had a girl under each arm, a beer in each arm, and they were about to run with it. And when I got hold of Ben, what did, and on Wednesday, we had had a meeting at quarter to seven, and we had another meeting at 7.30, and he was there at both those meetings. He'd gone to the pub next door for his sister's 21st and had a beer, just got a photo, and came straight back in. And they were, that was going to be an issue. So there's a lot more journalists than there used to be. They're all looking for the edge, a different X factor in a story, and the players just have to be very careful. Mate, they're doing their job. But with that comes a responsibility to the game, and that's what you're trying to get through to the players. Thanks, John, for that mention of that Friday's incident. That's that mate, was very I'm, good. Yeah, that's right. yeah. mate, I, I was dirty. I wasn't there, I think. I should have been there. <laughs> I've, Mary, seen, I've seen you at your very best. Thank you. uh, Mary, the, uh, we've, we've been discussing jockeys and how they suddenly go from nothing to uh, you know, virtually earning a fortune. Do you think it really is necessary in racing for... Uh, there's been a Someone fall. There's been a fall. Here. Reduce some of the tears again. Yeah. They, um, do you think in racing it really is necessary to introduce uh, almost full-time courses to guide these boys through? Because it is a sport which still really has an apprentices school, which is basically a couple of people turn up once a week and have a chat to them. Do you think it should be regulated? And do you think that um, that there should be a full-time person to monitor these people? Yeah, yeah, I definitely do, but I, I think it applies not just... I mean, you, you have to remember with the kids who are in racing and who come into the industry 
they don't only have the stresses of having to perform on the field that all other sports people do. They don't just have the stresses of physical fitness and competition day in, day out. There's a lot of emotional stress that comes with the physicality of what they're going through as well. And I know that applies to other sports, but it's particularly the case in racing where to, but as a society, people are getting bigger and bigger. The minimum weights issue for jockeys has only crept up you know, very incrementally as opposed to how much bigger we're all getting as people. So what they physically go through in trying to keep their weight under control um, to ride competitively these days adds a whole nother dimension, I think, to the stress and pressures that are probably unique to racing. And they're, um, and they're actually risking their lives, which most sportsmen are. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I think um, the other thing that needs to be remembered is and it happens in other sports when they have injuries as well. And except if you have an injury as a football player, um, you probably still have your team around you, your, your manager, your coach. There are probably still, you know, things that you can undertake as a team or as a part of a group of people in your rehabilitation. You still got contact. If a jockey's injured and can't ride through injury, they're basically left by themselves for be it three months or six months. Um, to their own devices to, to rehabilitate. And that's when a lot of them can get into trouble as well. So I do think, Mark, it is important that we have some for more formalised aspect of master and apprentice in particular that we used to in the old days because it's not the same, you know, relationship they have now. They don't, in the old days, they used to live with the person that they were apprenticed to. They used to do stable duties. They used to you know, almost be supervised like a parent. That doesn't happen anymore. So as a consequence, I think there needs to be some sort of formalised role and structure um, to make sure that we do protect them and that their careers can be as long as possible because that's the other thing when we do talk about the salaries of sports people. They all have a limited life. So I don't think we can deny them the capacity to earn, but we need to guide them to make sure that their longevity can stay and, you know, that they use that money sensibly in the future. Thanks, Mary. Dennis, you were talking about culture and swimming and what a good culture it is. You might just explain, because it fascinates me, uh, champion swimmers and top swimmers, what's the makeup of a swimmer? And do you think that uh, the personality of swimmers helps them then in their later life to be, uh, you know, more regimented, regimented, I should say? I mean, you very rarely hear even in later life of swimmers getting into too much trouble. Dawn got into a bit of trouble every now and again, but really, um, do you think it's their personality? Uh, I think individual sports, and especially in Olympic sport, uh, there's a lot more demanding in that regard, and I take on board, as you said, with, say, jockeys. Um, every sport has its inherent stress, and some are uh, life-threatening. If you're a motorcycle racer, I had Barry Sheen come down and speak to my, my squad many years ago and it was before he had his commentating duties and he said, oh, this, he'd never actually spoken uh, much when he first retired to Australia and he said, what do you want to be speak about? And I said, the consequences of mistakes. In our sport, it's pretty benign. I mean, you make a mistake and the clock ticks over half a second and, oh, you're disappointed, right? Or you failed to get a medal or you failed to make the final. Um, You've got to develop a, a culture that really appreciates absolute. Um, this is, I think this is what I'm continually involved with. I think shaping this sort of culture that can stand alone and, 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 and really mature ahead of its time because I've had a lot of 15 and 16 year olds on Australian team and no one cares that the saying is if you're good enough, you're old enough and you have to take on men people from everywhere, every part of the globe, and there's no holds barred in how you, you prepare a train. So you never know that you can, can never be content. You can't hide amongst your teammates. If they have a bad game and you stand out, you know, and you're pretty good, you might stand out. If they win, you might stand out a bit more. But, but when you get up on the block or you get out on the track or you, you're out there on your own and how you perform ultimately comes straight back to you. So you have to be very, very capable, not only with your preparation physically and so on, but mentally, emotionally, <coughs> you, you have to be ahead of your years. And that's something I think that you can't escape. And there's a certain reality in the sport, I think, that probably does mature them and uh, teaches them about life 
pretty well the reality of, uh, of, of being in a sport where if you'd want to be number one, unless you're number one, you're nobody, or at least around about. And uh, there's no excuses. You just have to face it. It's a totally honest sport, I feel. You can't escape whether you've done the work or you haven't, whether you're good enough or you're not. So I think that consistent and continual, continual reality check that they get growing up and no matter what level they take, ultimately there's only one thing. They've embraced the sport for all it's worth. When you've taken it on, there's only one thing. It's Olympics or Worlds and it's Olympics only. And that's every four years. You get one, one slice at it and, uh, and that's why it's such a, a, a precious thing. But there's no escapes, there's no support. Once you're there, you're out on your own. And uh, I think that really, really makes uh, a character that can stand up in life. Thanks, Ben. Now, I'll just say one word, Debbie, and you can tell me what you think of the managers <laughs> and how uh, important are they in shaping uh, young athletes? Well, I, I don't know that they do a lot of shaping. I think they're doing more a lot of shaving of uh, earnings. Um, I, th I think it's, it's one of the, the problems is because they, they you know, take a, whatever the deal is, whatever slice of the, of the income. Once they've got that, they, they, I mean, they can move on to the next to the next product and that's that's what it is to them. I don't think most managers take a lot of interest in the person, they're just out for the, the profit. And uh, if if that one, if you know, the, the player you've sold the big, I mean, one of the amazing things is you, you look at this in some of the sports, the, spot, uh, the managers have got players, uh, so many players across the board that they're almost, uh, I don't know how it's not a conflict of interest, they're negotiating contracts for, for players who they also have their rivals on their books. And so really, in a sense, I think there's no shortage for them of, of players who want management. So if they sell a sponsorship deal and, the, and it blows up because the, the player you know, misbehaves and he loses the sponsorship deal, then it's quite likely the same manager's got another player to step into the, to the void. So I think they're the kind of people that don't have a lot to lose and they, they have a lot to gain. And people don't, you know, the player managers are making a lot of money, but most people don't know what they look like, so there's, there's not a lot of interest in, in what they do or whether they're getting up to no good. So I think we, they yeah, make we, the... We still, did, we still don't know who the four in the Melbourne Storm fiasco is, do we? No. They, they haven't been well, known publicly. Well, that's what I mean. The, the, the players of the public face, you know, they copped... You know, the players and the, and the team management were the public face of that Melbourne Storm salary cap rorting. Now, the people who definitely knew were the managers. And the thing is, one, one of the sad things that, that I've seen about footballers is, and, you know, they vary, and, you know, I take a little bit of exception to, you know, the rug standard rugby league players growing up in a trailer park with his father holding a gun to his head. There are some from disadvantaged backgrounds. But there are also some reasonably bright people. But one of the, one of the problems is that they're used to having everything done for them. They, you know, I mean, I had a, we had a player who would come into the office and give the girls his uh, phone bills and gas bills and electricity because he didn't know how to do that. Um, you know, it was just like he had the money, but he didn't know. And the thing is, people will do it for them and they don't learn. They just live in this, this bubble of not having to deal with real life because their manager's dealing with it, their, their coach is dealing with it. Sometimes they're, um, you know, the, the girls in the office or their girlfriend or or whatever, and, and they sort of, they think, and in a sense they have to focus entirely on, on what they're doing, they focus on their sport. And I would think there would have been some of those Melbourne Storm players, I'm not saying all of them, who really had no idea uh, that, you know, what they were earning would put them over the salary cap, and because they're just focused, that's how they get to where they are, they, it's like somebody else looks after that, I concentrate on training, I concentrate on, on my job, and, and I, I pay someone else to, to worry about the money side of it. And players certainly don't stand around, I don't think, and say to each other, what are you earning, what are you earning, which, which would be how you'd work out you're over the cap. Now, whether or not they should have questioned if they were getting extra money coming from different accounts, but I don't know, sometimes even that goes through the manager. So I don't know whether for sure a lot of those players, but they're sort of encouraged to be like that. You concentrate on playing football and I'll look after this side of things for you. And, and I think a lot of times they get they make mistakes that get covered up and, th and then they become, un until they get famous, I, I think they get covered up for a lot when they're younger and, and people don't know and then some of them have never learnt the, 
consequences of their mistakes, have never learned how to behave themselves, have never learned sort of how to be a normal person in society because they've had this sort of elite run, rails run through it. And then when it blows up and they're in the paper and everybody knows who they are and they've done something wrong, they really, they're quite surprised. They, they've been protected and, and in a bubble and, and sort of they don't know how to handle it and sometimes they just handle it by getting worse. Yes, that's well said. Lindsay, you're a current player, um, a role model for you. You might explain who you look up to. Um, there's been a lot of people through my life. Um, actually, my, my auntie was an Olympic swimmer, so I looked to her for encouragement and how she um, drew, like, um, drew inspiration, especially when times were tough, especially injuries and hitting that next like, goal. And then, of course, um, I, I performed in two World Cups in 2006 and last year, and just that four-year period where I had to reassess and then work to the next goal. So, um, and especially there's a lot of Wallabies. I, you know, you see them and what kind of game you want the women's game to be like, really, because of course women's um, rugby has actually increased in pace since, especially 2006. Like my fitness had to jump, I would say, ten times since um, four years ago. So. Um, there's a lot of, I've taken inspiration from a lot of people and a lot of, like, especially my local club, there's a lot of um, coaches there that have, you know, just believed in me since 97 and then it took me nearly six years before I could really prove that I was, you know, worth, you know, running on with the gold jersey. So, but Lindsay, you can choose a role model, can't you? Mm. I mean, it's not as if everybody has to be a role model. No. You, you pick yeah. who, so there's, there's some choice involved. I, I think that's a, a point that's worth making, just everyone in sport doesn't have to be a role model of everybody because people should be smart enough to pick the right role model. Well, you'd hope so, wouldn't you? <laughs> now, speaking of role models, Michael, as I said, you've been called in uh, like an emergency doctor to a lot of people. Is, <laughs> has there been anyone that was unsavable as, uh, in a, as a sportsman or a sportswoman you've had to deal with? No, Obi, I think they, they grow up. So if you look at uh, Dennis Cottrell, who did a great job with Grant Hackett over a long period of time, is the Grant Hackett at 16 the same person that Grant Hackett is at, you know, 28, 29? Absolutely not. They all grow up. And to Debbie's point about this personal responsibility, we pay their bills, we put them on flights, we organise their weddings, we do absolutely everything. There's a really significant point, I think, in the Ben Cousins book, so I don't know whether anyone's read it, but he was at Wesley College and he was allowed at the age of 16 to walk to school and wear, wear to school white sand shoes. Everyone else had black shoes. Ben, you can wear white shoes, mate, because you've got the big game on the weekend. What, th these are the things that breed this behaviour. So th they move them to another school, another school being professional sport. They've got no genuine understanding about the boundaries. So as, a, as an educator, I suppose, my job is to try and narrow those boundaries and bring in a level of self-awareness that doesn't necessarily come in that professional sporting environment they're in because at the end of the day it's about W's and L's, wins and losses in the column and that above anything else overrides you know, their core function. Uh, we've actually got to wind up very quickly but I just want to ask John a quick question and then I just want to finish up with a quick question to each of our panellists. But uh, John, how important are partners? Um, Debbie was talking about chicks before and uh, well basically how important is for a player to have a good solid uh, relationship? Much the same as your four or five marriages. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got three children, 29, 28 and 6. I just, I just had a bad 20 years. Um, <laughs> it's not funny, Michael. <laughs> I, t I should tell you a story about Michael. Michael, uh, Mark spoke about the... Uh, I think this is funny. My, very innovative in marketing the game. The sprinklers on at half-time, parachutists. But I thought your very best was, was uh, the dog. Bomb of the dog to run the tea out to the players. The problem was a guy in the crowd had a pile of meat. Bomber ran straight past the player who dropped the tea off and headed off into the crowd. And the, ga <laughs> the game was held up for five minutes before we found the tea <laughs> out of the crowd. Um, partners, mate, there's no doubt you need a ground in your life. And, and that's what, as a, as, and the coach and the staff have a huge role in that, trying to ground the players. And I guess partners can be very grounding at times. Um, it depends who the partner is, I guess, and the wife. And, and you do, you see a player transition as he grows up and Michael spoke about that 16 to 28 where they, they're young out and about they've got children and their life changes again and and so forth so 
But that grounding, I think, is, is very important. And just a point on managers, as we were talking about before, I think the managers, the role of the manager has changed slightly. The good ones now will take the money, invest the money for the players through financial investments, and they'll provide the whole package. The good ones will. You've still got some shonky ones out there who will take the money and run, and we've all suffered from, from them. But I think the role of the manager very much is, is a whole-of-life whole manager that will employ people like Michael and so forth and bring them in and advise them, invest their money. They're aware of the problems that the players do have, that they don't live in the real world, and they'll guide them through that. So I think we've seen managers evolve a little bit. But back to partners, um, made important, but I don't think it's, it, it's over. It's, it's up to the individual. The rules change from individual to indi individual. Unfortunately, we've got to wind up because uh, I think the room's been booked for something else, hasn't it, Steve? So, uh, but just to finish off, if your child was a champion or a future champion in uh, your chosen sport, just in one sentence, what would be your advice to them? Mary? My advice would be to employ their own, what I'm going to call the 60-40 rule. 60% 60 of your salary you get just for turning up and doing your job. You've got to apply 10% of your salary to public relations, do what the club wants for you or your, your, your sport demands from you. Um, to PR, you get the next 10% of your salary um, if you go and do some real work, some real charity work. Not turning up for a Photoshop appearance, but turning up and, and not, not just going to the children's hospital, but, but delivering food or something. You get your next 10% of your salary if you actually put some training into yourself for vocation when you've finished your sport. And you might get the next, the last 10% if you're not an idiot, Mark, and, and you don't cost your team a game or you don't do something stupid like, like you know, let, let's think of a Campisi pass to a Greg Martin. He should lose 10% of his salary for that year for doing that. Or, or Greg Hall, who decides to go up saying he's won on Doremus and forever scarring me from ever watching Doremus and Might and Power again. So I think you've got to set boundaries for yourself um, or for your kids, you know. There's your 60%. There's your Do with it what you will. It's your money. Let's take that other 40% away from you and let's make you earn it each step of the way. Yeah, you'd be a tough mum. Yeah. Hey, uh, <laughs> Dennis, what would you say? If you're, to, to anyone who's going to be a champion, just, just very quickly, what, what should they live up expectations? Well, the old grandmother clause, I guess, if you're going to do a job, do it properly and take ownership. Right? It's, you, you know, your, the consequences are yours, the path's yours. Uh, basically, that's all I'd like them to do is, if they're going to take it on, it's their job, it's not their parents to pack their bag. They've got to be responsible for every uh, aspect of their involvement in the sport, and that includes their own management, let alone their training and, and obviously how to deal with what results come after that. But I think it's simply putting down the ethics, I think, for a, for a, a good life. Um, I don't see any, anything confusing in our sport because, um, you know, it's cut and dried and uh, you, you make it or you don't by your own efforts. And that's not just your physical efforts, it's, it's your management efforts because, and that's what Grant was very good at, or the champions are very good. I mean, you just don't come to training, it's how you manage yourself so that when you come to training you can give more than the other bloke who didn't manage himself as well and that's how you get to the top and I think that's uh, the honesty in the sport that brings its own character. Thanks, Dennis. Debbie, what would you say? Well, my girls never listen to anything I tell them anyway, so I probably wouldn't achieve much, but um, I would say pretty much the, the guts of what I, I said before, is that if you're going to be really successful in sport, fame is going to come with that and with Fame sounds like a lot of fun, but there's also a lot of downsides. And, and I would be pointing them in the direction of people who I think are fabulous role models in sport. And, you know, to me, it's people like Roger Federer. And, and he gets a, and someone who gets a lot of jibes and a lot of laughing, uh, you know, a lot of poking fun at him is David Beckham. But, I mean, those guys handle the media with an amazing grace. And they get... I mean, there's nowhere in the world that most of either of those two guys can go where they wouldn't be recognised, they probably can't go to a restaurant anywhere, do anything without people recognising them. They very very rarely lose their temper, they, they manage to sort of stay pretty serene about, about the whole thing. So I'd be picking good role models, 
not just at the sport, because yes, you've got to be an achiever in your sport, you've also got to be able to, if you get the success you want, you're going to have to deal with the fame that goes with it in, in, in a big time sport anyway. And uh, you've got to be prepared for that as well as prepared for the physical effort that you're going to need to put in to, to reach the sporting pinnacle. The fame that comes with it is going to be hard to handle and necessary to handle. Thanks, Debbie. Lindsay? Yeah, I would sort of say to them, um, enjoy every moment, respect yourself and others, and of course, um, aim for the top. <laughs> I always think. <laughs> Michael? Uh, three things, Ovi. Uh, start with the end in mind. So at the end of your career, you're going to finish with three things. You're going to finish with your record. Nothing much you can do about that. You're going to finish with your reputation and your relationships. What do you want it to look like? Johnny? I think there are three, uh, four pillars to success. Mate. Talent, opportunity, effort and learning. And um, talent's not always the most important, but the other three are incredibly important. And as I said to my six-year-old this morning, how are you going to... I said, mate, two things to remember. Remember, I love you. And keep your eye on the ball, the dog <laughs> said. So they're the two best bits of advice I can give anyone. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. That was terrific. I'm sorry we have to cut it short because, uh, well, I was learning a lot. I hope you learned something. Thank you.